I'd first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference this year again. And uh, my talk will be about complications of ASD closure uh, as one of the talks in the, this session titled as uh, Lessons Learned from Complications in Congenital Intervention. Transcatheter closure of a secondary ASD is a very uh, well established procedure. However, the procedure obviously um, carries uh, non negligible uh, risk of complications, including device embolization, cardiac erosion, arrhythmia, bleeding, infection, uh, and etc., uh, many of which may be uh, preventable. So uh, it is imperative that every operator has to be fully aware of uh, the, the various complications and uh, solutions for each of them. There have been efforts to clarify the details of complications associated with AIDS closure and thereby reduce the occurrence of the uh, preventable complications. This slide shows periprocedural complications from a meta-analysis involving a large population, over 28,000 uh, patients, and device embolization comprises nearly 60% of the major complications, and both major and minor complications appear to be more frequent in ASD patients than in PFO patients, uh, except for the vascular complications. Arrhythmia and cerebral vascular events were the leading cause of the complications at follow-up. Interestingly, both were far more frequent in PFO patients, which may reflect the different nature of the underlying disease rather, rather than, the, uh, than the, uh, the procedure or device itself. <coughs> in the MAUD database, uh, also, the device embolization was the most frequent complication, followed by erosion, device malfunction or malposition, and arrhythmias. Because of the time limitation, I would like to focus on device embolization, erosion, and arrhythmias today. I believe the uh, prevention of complications uh, starts from uh, following the routine process of uh, the procedure which is already established very well. First topic is device embolization. Device embolization during or after a closure procedure have been reported to occur in 0.5 to 1% in early series. Several risk factors have been uh, suggested, including large size of the device defect and rim deficiency, especially in the IVC rim. An embolized device can be retrieved in the cath lab without a significant adverse event in many cases. Otherwise, should be retrieved surgically with a concurrent, uh, concurrent closure of the defect. In case of device embolization, stabilizing the device in the safe location is first thing to do. You may snare the RA hub from the beginning. However, gripping the wire mesh using a biopton is usually faster for initial stabilization to prevent further migration. Simultaneously, team members other than the operators may take uh, actions like a call for surgical backup, uh, ensure proper anticoagulation, and preparing for uh, cardioversion just in case. Then you can take time for a, a detailed strategy to retrieve the dev uh, device, including some special techniques. This slide shows various measures to stabilize the device position in a safe location using a biopton, guide wire, or a pigtail catheter before subsequent uh, snaring of RA hub. So, so the cath lab should be properly equipped with various uh, uh, rescue tools. Retrie retrieval of an embolized amplitude type device usually requires a snare technique and you may encounter difficulty in pulling the device back into the sheets because of latching of the, the snared hub of RA disc uh, at the orifice of uh, the sheets. Couple of technical tips are known such as beveling the tip of the sheets using a wide angle catheter and the use of a larger sheets. I'd like to introduce some case examples. The first case is a young lady with a large ASD. I was invited to help the AS closure procedure in a provincial hospital. Transthoracic echo showed a large defect sized up to 36 millimeter. The defect was closed without difficulty using a 38 millimeter amplitude septal occluder 
which was the largest wearable device at, the, at that time. Device position was stable on Minnesota Wiggle and they released the, de uh, the device. However, the device embolized five minutes after release and then further migrated to our right ventricle. We attempted catheter manipulation to provoke a premature ventricular contractions, and by doing that, the device came back to right atrium and we could snare the device in right atrium. However, it was impossible to take the device into the schist because the hub of RA disc latched on the orifice of the schist, even at multiple attempts with manipulating the snare catheter and schist in different ways and different positions. So we stabilized the device in inter uh, IVC with an elongated shape and then uh, beveled the schist tip and tried again. However, retrieval of the device was still not possible with exactly the same reason. We inserted one, we inserted one more snare and hold the hub in the opposite direction uh, to correct the oblique angulation between the snared hub and the schist. So the device could be uh, successfully retrieved by using two snare, two snare technique. How does it work? In this movie clip, you can see the second snare helps to bring the hub into the schist. Second case is a 51-year-old gentleman with a large and multiple ASDs and the, uh, atrial fibrillation and severe pulmonary hypertension. The PBR was in the gray zone. However, we found uh, more than four defects, including small defects. So we decided to close two larger defects. The 34 millimeter sizing balloon, which uh, was uh, overdilated up to 37 millimeter, failed to obliterate the shunt through the largest defect. We placed the 40 millimeter device in the largest hole and found it fits the defect very well. And also we could see other defects more clearly. Second large defect was 15 millimeter in size. To make the long story short, I was not so smart at the time of this procedure. And we uh, decided to put an 80 millimeter device in the 15 millimeter defect and then close the lar largest defect using the same sheets. And the 80 millimeter device was embolized to LA due to my fault and further migrated to the distal uh, aortic arch. So we snared the RA disc hub by retrograde approach from the femoral artery and gently pulled the back device down to, the below, uh, down to below the renal arteries and then retrieved the device using two snare uh, with the four French right jacking chronic catheters uh, through a nine French non beveled sheets without difficulty. I would like to explain the working principles of double snare technique using these video clips from the bench test. Even though you use two snares, if, uh, if you snare the same side, uh, latching may occur. Then you can push the first snare and pull the second snare a little bit, which may change the orientation of the hub. You can continue to pull both snare catheters to introduce the RA hub into the sheath. Otherwise, if you snare the opposite side of RA hub, as you can see in the right panel video clip in this slide, you can see the device can be more easily introduced into the sheath. How to get an opposite position of two snares? Press, uh, pass the distal end of first snare catheter through the second snare, like threading the needle. Go forward with the second snare to the device and then pull the first snare slowly while pushing the second snare. Then you can get the opposite position between two snare catheters. The Ocrotec device has similar, uh, smaller and bowl shaped RA hub, which may cause uh, slipping out of the snare during retrieval of the device. Uh, th this problem uh, also uh, has been uh, reported in some interventional meetings and the double snare technique helps to securely hold the, the small hub, thereby prevent the slipping of the snare from the RA hub. There are a few case reports in which they uh, pulled back the snare de device from right ventricle 
or even from primarily to RA or IBC. I, however, I would like to emphasize that the pulling back the uncollapsed device against cardiac valves may cause serious valve damage. In summary, a large defect with a limb deficiency, especially in the IBC rim, carries a higher risk of device embolization. In case of device embolization, don't panic. Be prepared and familiar with the general principles and follow the principles. The double snare technique enables an effective retrieval of embolized device without changing the sheath to a larger one. Next topic is erosion. Even though this uh, issue is drawing huge attention, it is true that we don't have enough knowledge nor a solution for this uh, very complicated problem. Erosion is a very rare complication. However, it is possibly fatal. It occurs at the atrium to aortic junction or at the roof of atria. Several risk factors are known such as aortic rim deficiency, vigorous minister wiggle, septal malalignment, or, uh, or so on. We all know about the recommendation from the Sentinel paper to prevent erosion, which was published in 2004. There have been some improvements in the instance of erosion since the 2004 recommendations. However, it is also true that there have been no significant progress in understanding the uh, definite cause or in uh, finding a reasonable solution for erosion. Different mechanisms of erosion have been suggested, and many are believing local encroachment of atrial disc onto the aorta is prerequisite of erosion, as in case shown in this slide. And a malalignment of septum is believed to be one of the, the important factors to provide, to produce a risky condition to de uh, develop significant impingement of atrial disc. In 2012, Zaida Amin published a paper regarding the evaluation of aortic rim deficiency, which described the true meaning of aortic rim deficiency is a deficiency of a broader area of retro aortic rim in multiple consecutive views from the echo, not just in a single, echo, single plane. He also published a paper regarding the echo echocardiographic uh, predictors of erosion in 2014. In this article, he provided an additional insight to this issue by an investigation on 12 new erosion cases after his Sentinel paper published in 2004. Important sharing feature among the patients include absent aorta rim in multiple views with bold aorta, poor posterior rim consistency, dynamic ASD, and the malalignment of the septum. Echo predictors after device placement uh, were wedging of the atrial dis discs between the aorta and the posterior wall, tenting of the atrial free wall into the transverse sinus and the pericardial effusion. So patients with uh, those uh, echo findings have to be followed more closely with, of course, adequate information and education of the patients. I would like, uh, I would like to skip this in concerns of time. So what to do? I believe at uh, all the operators uh, have to be fully aware of the risk factors and the findings. A great morphology uh, diagnosis is very important so that uh, identify high risk patients, follow the instructions for use, and uh, last but not least, proper edu uh, properly educate patients and parents for warning signs of erosion. Arrhythmias. Clinically significant Significant AV block after ASC closure is very rare. However, it has been sporadically reported. The first paper drawing attention to this issue was published in 2004 with uh, reported uh, the some relatively benign course in all patients. And after this study, a case with a progressive deterioration of AV block, which necessitated permanent pacemaker implantation have been reported. And in 2010, two cases of symptomatic AV block refractory to steroid, steroid therapy with subsequent surgical device removal had also been uh, reported. They postulated large device size and inferior rim deficiency as a, a risk factors. 
Couple of papers have been uh, published regarding the incidence, fate, and the management options of uh, atrial fibrillation with ASD. Patient with paroxysmal AFib before closure usually maintain sinus rhythm after closure with or without episodes of paroxysmal AFib. However, th for the patients with uh, persistent AFib before closure, uh, there are several treatment options as uh, listed in this slide. And this slide shows uh, the data from uh, uh, our institute on the newly de uh, developed uh, atrial fibrillation after large ASD closure. It is our routine protocol that the check 24 hour whole tone monitoring before and after the AS closure, uh, after one year after the, clo the closure. Proximal AFib was detected in 11 patients. Four of them still have a proximal AFib and seven patients are in normal sinus rhythm. Two patients developed uh, persistent AFib. One patient underwent radio frequency catheter ablation in sinus rhythm uh, and maintains a sinus rhythm at the moment. And uh, we are following the other patient with uh, some medications. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, transcatheter closure of ASD is a safe procedure. However, there are non-negligible risk of uh, complications. And uh, every operator has to be fully informed of uh, various complications so that uh, uh, predict the risk and thereby avoid complications. And also should be, uh, all the operators should be prepared for the dealing with uh, complications. Thank you very much for your attention.